Welcome to Talking Heads on USA Global TV, starring the one and only wonderful Dr. Jacqueline. It's a prestigious place where world-class influencers and experts meet, and where you'll find the most trusted advisors and coaches for all things in life and business. Visit usaglobaltv.com to sign up for our newsletter, get the value you need, and be first in line to learn about events and giveaways and other valuable content. Connect with us. Email Dr. Jacqueline at usaglobaltv.com to talk about how you can become part of USA Global TV. That's USA Global TV, where the doctor is always in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to USA Global TV and radio. It's official as of Friday of last week. So you can not only watch us, you can also listen. You can take us with you wherever you go. I'll be posting some information about where you can listen. Our show today is The Corner Bookstore. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck, and my co-host, Diane floyd Bame has the day off. Joining me is another phenomenal team member here at USA Global TV. I am so thrilled and encouraged of how we all support each other. His name is Roland Friedel, and in addition to being the co-host of The Mallorca Show, uh, he also, the Mallorca Connection, I'm sorry, he's also an expert talking head, which means that he has extensive experience in many fields, and he has his own TV show here that he presents talking heads. And he's also an elevated listener, which means that he has invested his time and money to learn how to listen at a higher level. And what this all means together is that he's someone that you absolutely should get to know. You can reach him on his website, which is rollandfriedel.com. Let's welcome him to the program. Hi, Roland. Hi, Dr. Jacqueline. Great to see you again. Nice to see you as well. And I'm so honored and thrilled that while you are traveling in your RV through Europe, that you are able to make our shows and make it a priority. Because I know it's not easy to find Wi-Fi while you're traveling, but I'm going to spotlight you as always. And for people who haven't met you before, they haven't been on the Mallorca Connection or Talking Heads, please share a little bit of background about yourself and how you help people. Yeah, first of all, thanks for inviting me. And and uh, it's always an honor and a pleasure to to join the show and, and, and do my contribution to the show. And I love this show today because I love books. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Roland uh, from Accent You Can Hear. I'm not American or UK, I'm um, Austrian. Born in Austria, a little country, beautiful little country in the middle of, of, of Europe. Um, yeah, who I am? Uh, first of all, I'm a, a human being. I'm a man. I'm a father, a grandfather and a lover, first of all. And I dedicated my life over three decades uh, to support organizations and their leaders worldwide uh, with my team in many, many languages. Uh, not only to perform better, um, making better sales, more profit, more market shares, whatever, but also to support their leaders to have a more purposeful and yeah, fulfilled, energized, happy life. Because from my background, when I was shortly in the corporate world, I left it early. I feel I didn't feel comfortable there. I was working a lot. I, I made some good money, but I, you know, I, I came back home. Uh, my kids, I have three boys at the time, they were small. I was so exhausted. I had no time to be really present when I'm home in the night and in the evening when I came home or on the weekends. Uh, so I, I had to take care about myself. I was just a food addicted. I was drinking a little bit just to, to calm down, but I had actually not really being uh, present for my kids. And so I said, I have to change this. And I, 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 always, I started my own companies in different areas successfully. And then I started uh, training and coaching companies came to me and, and wanted me to coach them. I say, yeah, I help you, of course, to perform better. I help you executive management. But I, for my own story, I will also support you not only to be more successful in business, but be more successful and happy in your entire life with your family. Because it doesn't make any sense when you make a hell of money and your private life is not in good shape, your relationships. So I dedicate this for over three, for three decades. And yeah. I support, I uh, also coach people who want to have the same crazy, I say crazy life on myself, <laughs> crazy, because it's not the normal, the average lifestyle I have. I spent the last 14 years on a beautiful island uh, in Mallorca. That was my home base, although I was traveling all the time. And since 1st of April, I moved into my RV in my motorhome. I used it the last four years just for traveling, and it was always a dream to yeah, to work and live full-time in a re and, and travel in Europe. So it was just a perfect timing. Uh, 
for me, meaning the well, this is a perfect timing. There's never a perfect timing. I made a decision to do it. You know, we have also excuses. Me too. And I said, no, I made a decision. I do it. And once the decision was failed, it felt really, really good. So, yeah, right now I'm standing in front of a farmhouse in, in close to Salzburg, if anybody knows our Austria, you know, Mozart, uh, this famous composer and, and the Swedes. <laughs> more, more, yeah, more people know the Swedes than maybe his amazing uh, classical music. Yeah, I'm broadcasting from here. And um, yeah, we did three shows yesterday. We did three shows the day before. So it's, I, I love it. I love to support this platform because uh, people need more positive news and and there's so many cool experts, so many interesting interviews, connecting people. It's all about connecting, caring, and sharing. That's why I'm back here, and thanks for that. Thank you so much, Roland. I really appreciate it. And uh, last thing I just would love for you to touch on quickly is the new show that you'll be leading to uh, support men, for men, by men. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Yes, you know, with my experience with, with mostly male managers and executives worldwide from huge companies, um, and I, I started uh, two years ago um, an, on, an online platform. Um, there's also a website. You can find a link on my main website on rollandfriddle.com. It's Sparing for Men. Uh, um, this is a platform. It's a U.S. platform and also a European platform. We meet uh, twice a month, just men and just in, in a safe environment, heartful, safe environment. We, it, we just uh, talk about our role as a man, um, how we feel as a man in business, how we feel as a man in our relationships, our sexuality, uh, as being a father. Uh, we talk about all this stuff because mostly men are not very open and not talking about emotions and just it. And actually, we have people from all over the world, from the US, from, from Europe, uh, from Asia, uh, all kinds of, I would say, colors, religions, and, 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 and business backgrounds. But we have one in common. We are men. And from there uh, was the idea, to, uh, together with you, Dr. Jacqueline, uh, to bring this on, on, a t on here on USA Global TV. So we will start in May a show called Wild at Heart, uh, bonfire talks, real, authentic, uncut, where five to six men meet on a daily, uh, on a weekly basis every Wednesday. Uh, it will be 7 p.m. Central European time, so this is 1 p.m. Um, East Standard Time in the U.S. Uh, on the East Coast. Um, came, five to six men come together uh, every week on Wednesday, uh, and we do a show for men with men topics. It can be very deep and about emotions, what, what I talked before, uh, what we do on the platform, but it can also be shallow, like, I don't know, what kind of car should I buy, or <laughs> can you uh, should, should I grow a beard or not, or, not, or what you're using uh, for, for fitness, or do you do whatever you're doing? So all men topics we discuss, like sitting on a bonfire that me thousands of years ago, men sitting together, uh, helping each other, warming their hearts on the fire. That's what we do. And yeah, I'm very looking forward to that. Thank you so much for sharing that with our audience. I'm excited about it as well. Uh, I'm also excited to bring out our guest. Uh, this is the first time that he's been on the platform, so we want to welcome him. He is an award-winning science fiction and fantasy author. He's also an editor, a narrator, a writer, a publisher, and a podcast host, and his name is Edward Willett. Let's bring him on. Hi, Edward. How are you? Hi. Thanks for having me on. <clears throat> Hi, Edward. Hi. Thanks for being here. Where are you joining us from today? Uh, I am in Regina, Saskatchewan, where it's currently snowing because we just caught the edge of a huge blizzard that's been tearing across the northern states and into Manitoba. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a white Easter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that you have strong Wi-Fi and that you're able to be here today. I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy to be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so you've accomplished quite a lot in your life. And I know that uh, you have some, some new things that are coming out that we're going to be talking about. But for people who are just joining us, and this is your first time here, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your background, why writing, being an author, being a publisher, podcast host, why all these things are important to you. And what do you feel is the value that your audience takes from it? Well, I became interested in writing as a reader, as I think most of us do. And uh, I, I had two older brothers, and they both read science fiction. So I was plugged into the science fiction world fairly early on. It, it was around the house. Uh, I think somewhere, maybe even on my desk here, I still have maybe the first science fiction novel I read called Revolt on Alpha C by Bob Silverberg, which uh, Robert Silverberg, which he wrote when he was 19. And I read it when I was about, I don't know, eight or something. 
And about the time I was 11 years old, I was getting interested in writing. And I wrote my first complete short story for something to do on a rainy day when I was 11. And it was called Castor Glass Hypership Test Pilot. So you can see that my mind was already pretty set on the science fiction side of things. And uh, I, had a, I had a teacher. Uh, teachers are often very important to people who become writers. And I had one who took my writing seriously. So uh, I took it to my grade seven English teacher, Tony Tunbridge. Uh, grade eight maybe and uh, he uh, he read it and he was um, he took it seriously he said you know i don't understand why your alien acts like that and i didn't understand this and, and i've credited him ever since in fact i dedicated a recent novel to him it was that sort of you know i could do better and the next thing i write is going to be better and i just started writing longer and longer stuff i wrote three novels in high school and toward the end of my high school i decided I had a lot of things I was interested in. I could, I'm could. i also an actor. I, I'm, a, I'm a professional actor, but that was kind of a sideline I went into. I, I didn't go into acting. I didn't go into music because I sing. I didn't do that either as a, as a career. I decided to go into writing. And science was my other interest. Uh, but I went into writing. I became a journalist, newspaper reporter, and editor for at the Weyburn Review, uh, my hometown in Weyburn, Saskatchewan, about an hour southeast of here. And I was there for eight years. I was news editor of the newspaper at the ripe old age of 24. I became editor of the newspaper. I did that for a few years. Came up here as communications officer for the Saskatchewan Science Center uh, here in Regina. And uh, so there was my science interest came in. But all that time I was writing. And coming up on 30 years ago now, I quit my job and became a full-time writer. And although I do call myself primarily a science fiction and fantasy writer, in fact, of the 60 some books I've had published, probably 40 of them are actually nonfiction. Uh, so I write anything and everything. And uh, then a few years ago, I started my publishing company and, um, and the podcast came along about four years ago where I interview other science fiction and fantasy authors about their creative process. So I think what it comes down to for me is that I simply, I want to create things and I want to help other people create things and I want to get those stories out into the world. And uh, that's what everything I do is about, is creating stories and sharing them with other people. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, when I was preparing for the show, I saw that you have a broadcast on your, um, I say, um, yeah, a project that's called World Shapers. Can you explain to me and to the audience what, what, what is World Shapers? What, what, what's all about it? Well, Sounds the so podcast? The podcast yeah. or the book series? Because uh, there's actually the, the reason it's called World Shapers is because I have a book series called World Shapers. <laughs> uh, okay. and, but also it's it's the idea that uh, in science fiction, we often talk about world building where you're creating mm -hmm. worlds that don't exist. Uh, but I often think that world shaping is a better term. And in the early part days of the podcast, I used to make this point with, with guests and I would ask them about it. The idea that you can... Um, you're, you're really taking the real world. That's all we've got to work with. It's what's in our heads. Yeah. It's what we've read. It's what we think about. We're really taking the, that world and we're shaping it into a different form. And uh, that's what I think fiction is. Even if you're writing mainstream fiction, which appears to be set in the here and now, it's actually set in a shaped version of the here and now. It's not the real world. You cannot cram the entire real world into a novel. You're shaping a fictional world in which your events take place. So that's where the, the, the uh, name World Shapers comes from. And I applied it to the podcast because I'm interviewing people who shape worlds, other, other authors. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's where the name came from. Uh, that, that's interesting. Thank you for that. I have a question on that uh, because I understand when you're writing science fiction, you write something that is hasn't maybe not existed until now. So you have you need new words to describe it. From your experience, uh, these words that are used by authors in science fiction, how many of them have been common in our language now, normal now? Oh, I don't know. I don't think anybody's ever. I don't know if anybody's ever done a study of that. There are certainly concepts that first came up in science fiction that then became widespread. I, I think one famous example is the waterbed, which was invented by Robert A. Heinlein in one of his short stories, and it eventually became an actual product and things like that. Uh, there's words like uh, uh, cyberpunk, uh, which has made it kind of into the wider realm from originally just being a subgenre of science fiction. Now there's steampunk, which is kind of similar as well. Uh, so there are a few things like that that, uh, that creep in, but uh, I, I would hesitate to say how many. A lot of a lot of the words you make up in science fiction are strictly for your book. Um, I have a, a young adult uh, novel that came out last year called Star Song, up for an Aurora Award for Best Canadian Young Adult uh, Science Fiction Novel this year. 
just slip that in there. Uh, and it's uh, it's uh, got a word in it called touch lyre, which is not a real word, but I needed it to describe a special kind of musical instrument. So most of us make up these words on the fly uh, in our stories. And how many of them escape into the real world, I guess, depends on how popular your <laughs> how popular your your story is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And Edward, with your anthology series that's coming out, can you just share with our audience who's not sure what does anthology mean? And then how do people get uh, the ability to be featured in work that you're doing? Because I know that you feature other authors and you publish other people's work as well. Is that correct? Yes, the anthologies came out. Okay, first of all, an anthology is a collection of short pieces by a variety of authors, various authors. Uh, if it's called a collection, which I've also published, I published a collection of my short stories called Paths to the Stars. So that's usually, if it's called a collection, it's usually one author. If it's an anthology, it's usually a selection of short pieces. It doesn't have to be fiction. It could be essays. I mean, it's still an anthology if it pulls together a lot of different authors under one uh, book. Um, when I started my publishing company, Shadowpaw Press, named after our cat, Shadowpaw, our black Siberian cat. In fact, his picture is the logo on every book. Um, I, that was in 2018, and I hadn't started the podcast yet. Uh, but because I was uh, I had this publishing company, I became a member of Sask Books, which is the Saskatchewan Association of Publishers. I'm now vice president. And um, there was an, uh, at our annual meeting, there was a presentation about kickstarting an anthology by another publisher from Winnipeg. Uh, and I thought, hey, I know some authors. Uh, because at that point, when that came along, I had started my podcast and I was interviewing all these authors. And so those two things came together. And I thought, well, what if I asked the get authors who have been on my podcast uh, from the first year, because I had to make it, you know, arbitrarily cut it off somewhere, uh, if they would like to contribute to an anthology. And uh, I had 18 authors that said yes out of that first year, nine original stories, nine reprints. And these were big names like John Scalzi and David Brin and Joe Haldeman and, and Sean and McGuire, you know, because I've interviewed some of the biggest names in the field. Uh, and so how am I going to pay for it? I kickstarted it and I kickstarted it successfully and raised uh, the first one, I don't know, about $16,000 Canadian. And since that worked, I did it again last year with my second year guests. And I did it again this year with my third year guests. So the first two are out. The third one will be out this fall. Uh, and it'll be at this point, uh, there will have been some 60 authors now that I will have published short fiction, uh, the bulk of it original, a few reprints. So in order to get into that, you first have to be a guest on my podcast. And to do that, you have to be a published science fiction and fantasy author. And, <laughs> you know, so that one's not really open to people. But on the Shadowpaw Press itself is going to increasingly publish more books by other authors. And in fact, I have two new ones coming out this fall, not science fiction fantasy at all. Although one of the authors, uh, it's a young adult uh, outdoor adventure story called The Amir's Falcon. Uh, he is actually a science fiction fantasy author, but this is not a science fiction fantasy work. And the other one's by a brand new author. And it's very much uh, it's set in the 50s and post-war Saskatch Saskatchewan and features horses and professional women's baseball. So that's an interesting combination. <laughs> so, but Shadowpaw Press will, over time, I hope, be open to more um, authors. And I will at some point post submission you know, requirements on the website. So if you go to the website um, and keep an eye on that, eventually there might be an opportunity there. Wasn't that exciting? Well, we'll see. Either that or I go broke. That's the other option. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question to you as an author, because maybe some of our audience was has a dream writing his or her own book. Especially for myself, I also was thinking about that for many years, and I started now. Uh, when you write a book, you just write from the bottom of your heart what you want to write, or are you doing in advance some research what sells better? What is my audience expecting? How, how does this process work? Well, it's been different over the years. When I started, I was writing everything, as they say, on spec, which is you write whatever you want, and then you see if you can find somebody who wants to publish it. Now, these days, of course, the self-publishing option didn't exist when I, when I started. I was back in the days when you typed it up and you put it in a box and you mailed it, and six months later, you got a rejection. And I did, went through that a lot because uh, it was years before I had anything published. Um, but once I've, my main publisher now is Daw Books in New York, which is one of the major science fiction and fantasy publishers. I'm coming up on my 12th novel for them, which will be out this spring, this fall. And uh, at this point with them, I'm able to just come up with a, an idea 
and a synopsis and I might have two or three ideas and I run them by my editor or my agent and uh, we decide which one is the one to go with. So at this point, that's the way uh, I'm working. But at the heart of that, it's still me coming up with a story that I want to write. On the nonfiction side of things, that's almost always commissioned and somebody wants me to write. I did a bunch of educational books. So I've done biographies of like uh, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and then the Ayatollah Khomeini just for a completely different uh, line of things. And I've done local history books like the history of the Saskatchewan Mining Association. That stuff is usually not necessarily what I would choose to write, but somebody comes to me and says, we will pay you to write this. And as a full-time freelancer, I say, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's so interesting, Edward. I've published one book and I have a second one coming out and it sounds so easy. You, well, I come up with it, this synopsis and, and then bingo, it's a book, but it's not that easy, is it? It's just you you have figured out this process for success. Well, when whenever anybody asks me about how you learn to write, and I was asked that in another interview not that long ago, and my advice is always the same. You have to read because you have to know how books work and how stories work and how people deal with dialogue and description and, you know, you have to absorb that stuff on some fundamental level. But the other thing is just practice. I mean, the longer you do this, I liken it to exercising a muscle. Uh, and, uh, you know, the longer you do it, the longer you get, to, you eventually get to the point where you can simply do it. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that every idea you come up with is, is, you know, particularly great. But I've talked to authors who have taken on the challenge of writing a short story a week. Uh, I've never done that. I think I could, but I think I don't have enough time <laughs> these days to do that. Uh, but I did a, a poetry book, for example, a few years ago. Um, our poet laureate here in Saskatchewan, every it was Poetry Month, which was April, so it was 2018. Um, he he sent out every day two lines of poetry from published Saskatchewan poets, and the challenge was to create a new <laughs> poem using those lines or responding to them in some way. And much to my surprise, I wrote a poem every day for 24 days using those as little springboards, and every one of them was a mini science fiction or fantasy short story, which I put out then in a book called I Tumble Through the Diamond Dust. Uh, and, my, you know, and, and for me, it's just like, well, I've got that. And it's a, you think about it and you ask questions about it. And, and my brain is trained to find these weird science fictional fantasy things. So it's very much something that you, you learn to do by doing, I think. It's in, it's interesting because you know forty around forty years ago, Ernest, Ernest Hemingway was my hero, you know, and in my mind, you know, in my, my mind it was okay. This guy's not really working. He's writing some books, traveling, going on a wild game, having some 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 whiskey, some girls. What an amazing life! But when I listened to you and other authors, I said, no, no, that's not reality. It's really hard work. It's really hard. You, you, eventually, it comes down to sitting here and typing. That's what it comes down to eventually. <laughs> hours at a time and then reading what you wrote over and over and revising it and then it goes to an editor and you read it again and you revise it then the page proofs come in and you copy edit it and revise it and by the time a book comes out i am so sick of that particular book that i it comes out and i think that's cool here's another book and i open it up and say oh i don't want to read that so <laughs> <laughs> you know ever i can relate I, to that when i uh, when i finished my dissertation for my doctorate and I had my mentor, he made me rewrite my dissertation 118 times. And I remember because I used to scratch off every time I was like, again, I have to do it and again, I have to do it. But that's what it takes. And, and the editing is so key because as readers, when we see mistakes or grammatical errors, it's kind of a turnoff. And if you see them too many times, you might just put the book down and then your reputation as an author is it's impacted. Yeah. But there's always what you never get them all. You never, right. never get them all. <laughs> and I, as I said, I was a newspaper editor and some of the typos that would make it into headlines or into stories uh, where, you know, they, the paper comes out and you're looking and said, how did I miss that? There was one that was a it was a photo of a of a kid playing in a playground and the caption said, well, it's better than school for a boy was what the caption was supposed to say. Now, in those days, it went through a typesetting stage, so somebody retyped it. And what came out in the paper was, well, it's better than alcohol for a boy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's where the typesetter's name uh, mind was at. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Edward, Edward would you uh, describe yourself as a perfectionist, meaning are you writing or typing just as the flow goes, or are you always rethinking, I use this word or this verse, I change it, I change it, or oh, what's your process? Uh, I am a start at the beginning and type to the end type of writer, but I've talked to writers who do a rolling revision where every day the first thing they do is go back and revise what they wrote the previous day. Um, 
for me, I type to the end and then I go back and start revising. And it's on those second and third and fourth passes that I'm more likely to be tweaking language uh, and finding the things. And <laughs> the older I get, the more my 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 fingers short circuit from my brain. So my fingers will type like the first two letters of a word and then they think, oh, I know what word this is. And they'll put something out. And when I go back and read it, I say, no, that was just like half the word. And that's not the word at all. It's, it's very strange. It's, it's so much of a, an automatic process. And uh, at some point, the brain is not entirely engaged in what's going out through the fingers. <laughs> but it's on those second and third patches, passes, I'm looking at things like, you know, heightening the language or, and often then when my editor comes back, what I find with my particular uh, work is that it usually gets longer because she will want more uh, description or explanation of, of why characters did things and things like that. So uh, it's different for every author. Some write long and then get shorter. I, I apparently write mostly shorter and then get, <laughs> get longer. <laughs> then, do, then do the cream in between. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Edward, we're going to take a, a short break, Roland as well. We're going to take a break here from some of our sponsors. And when we come back, I would love to have you touch on this topic because it really it's something that people are very interested in when we go through the options of how to publish and, mm -hmm. and with whom we should publish. Would you be able to talk on that as well? Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. All right, we're going to start off um, our sponsorships with uh, a message from Diane Floyd Bame. And again, she is our co host for the show and she has the day off and she's also celebrating her birthday. So happy birthday, Diane. And we'll be right back here on USA Global TV and radio. Hello boys and girls, and welcome to Story Garden. Your host, Diane Bain. I'm so happy to have you here today. Diane Floyd Bain tells wonderful stories that warm the heart, spark the imagination, and unite people and families across generations. For children, Diane's Harry the Camel connects with all of us who've ever wondered how different our lives might have been if only we'd been born something better, like a wonderful horse instead of an ordinary camel. In the end, we all learn along with Harry that there's nothing better than just being yourself. Diane's little girl in the moon looks down on earthbound children and wonders if they know she's just like them. A story of love, home, and the bond between mother and daughter, its powerful theme that we're each of us different yet all of us the same plants a seed in children that promises to blossom within a loving and trusting grown-up. Diane's new biography, Rise, recounts the experiences of her grandmother, Ruby, to reveal the hidden strength of the human spirit. Ruby's story inspires all of us to become the best versions of ourselves. You'll find all of Diane's delightful books and much more at dianefloydbame.com. Visit d-i-a-n-n-f-l-o-y-d-b-o-e-h-m.com. That's dianefloydbame.com. Networking sucks and people suck at it, but nothing gives me more life than walking around and talking to people in an audience and really being able to identify, okay, I can, I see where you're having trouble, let's work on fixing it. How do you help them? How do you provide value? My goal is to give them those tools to be able to go out and tackle that fear. Anywhere there's coffee is where I'll be. So I bring candy a lot to my speaking engagements. Um, duh. Like, of course that makes sense. I'm a little unconventional. Ashley was very knowledgeable. Very entertaining. I learned a few new things, and to me, that's the key. What do you want them to say? How do you want to be perceived? You're going to get the most direct, tactical tips and practical takeaways when it comes to networking. These two here are super important. You'll remember once the conversation starts. I love the tips that she gave out. I hate networking with a passion, so I feel like I can go to a meeting or event and not feel so uncomfortable. When you're going to a presentation, you want to be educated. You also want to be entertained. She was really fun and really personable, and everything she was saying was just very relatable. So she's got a whole lot of great ideas. That will make you stand out so fast. She comes across as someone that likes what they do and just doesn't try to sell you something. Activity breeds results. 
If you're not doing anything, you're not going anywhere. It just made me want to start networking, which I never thought I'd say before. A networking strategy that works for you. everyone and welcome back to USA Global TV and now radio. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck and our show today is The Corner Bookstore. Diane Floyd Bame has the day off and joining me from his RV somewhere in Europe is Roland Friedel. And our award-winning author is here with us today. He's also an editor and a publisher and so much more. Edward Willett, welcome back to the program. Thank you. All right, I'm excited to explore this topic of publishing and which route should we take. So there's always the self-publishing, there's a hybrid model, there's working directly with a big publishing house. What are your thoughts about this? And if you could share with our audience, what's the value in working with a publisher as opposed to self-publishing? I've done all three types now. Um, I started, there was only traditional publishing when I started uh, to speak of. I was actually fairly early on, I did ebook only publishing, like ebook originals when before that really took off. My timing has often been bad and I'm either, you know, ahead or behind, I don't know, of the curve sometimes. Uh, I've done hybrid publishing. My poetry book was actually through a hybrid publisher. Um, and then uh, my, I've set, I've done just straight self publishing and then I started the publishing company. So now, I've done the, that kind of self-publishing and now I'm publishing other people. So I've gone full circle and I've become a traditional publisher. Uh, so it's, you know, I, I've, I've experienced it all. Uh, the advantage of a publisher, a traditional publisher, is that your main focus is going to be on writing the best book that you can. And there's somebody else that does all that stuff like designing the cover and getting out a catalog and trying to get it into bookstores and putting it on for sale and then all that stuff. Uh, you don't have to, you concern yourself with marketing obviously and that you do interviews and whatever you can, but ultimately it's the publisher that's putting the bulk of the, that sort of background work. And there's a ton of it as you quickly find out if you move on to self-publishing. With self-publishing, you do everything. And also if you own your own publishing company, <laughs> as I do, you're doing everything. And, uh, and you know, so that means uh, getting the covers designed and the interior layout and the, the editing and the proofreading and the, all that stuff and getting, and getting the books printed and getting them distributed and getting the eBooks out to all the outlets and collecting the royalties and just and correcting the money and distributing the royalties to the authors. All that stuff falls on you. Uh, if you're self-publishing, you're not distributing royalties to anybody but yourself, but still all that other stuff falls on you. And then in hybrid publishing, uh, there is somebody that you are paying to do that stuff. Um, so that's an interesting one to me. I did it, but uh, knowing very much what I was doing because my basic philosophy as a writer, being a full-time freelancer has always been the money should come to me. I shouldn't be paying other people to do anything. Publishers pay me to publish my books. I don't pay people to publish my books. So that's been a bit of a mindset change uh, as well. But that's the big difference for if a traditional publisher and um, you have somebody else and they often have a network of distributors or a network of sales agents who are trying to get books into bookstores if they're a big publisher all that kind of stuff. You really can't duplicate some of that as a self-publisher, as a, uh, a hybrid publisher can't really quite do the same thing either. Uh, it just depends on what works for you and how, how much you want to be in total control and are willing to do all the work necessary to make it a success. And there are people out there self-publishing who make way more money than I ever have. Uh, and uh, you know, so it can be done, but it is a lot of work. 
Thank you for sharing that, Edward. And you just mentioned money. And I'm wondering, uh, I've heard about this, I haven't experienced myself, but where the author will get a check in advance to write something. And then based on what the sales are, I guess you split up the royalty some way. What is that called? Yeah, it's called an advance. Uh, and that's the traditional <laughs> model with a big publisher. Now, you know, I'm not offering an advance because I'm tiny. So I'm just paying royalties on whatever the sales turn out to be. But for my New York publisher, I get an advance. Um, so if I, I'm, I'm writing this synopsis, I, I present it to them and the editor comes back and says, okay, we'll take this book. They send me a contract that says, uh, by this date, you will have submitted a 100,000 word novel and uh, we will give you this amount of money in advance. You get half of that money when you sign the contract. You get the other half, but well, this is typical. It could be set up some other way. If it's a huge, huge advance, which I've never had, it's often split up over a longer period of time. But uh, typically you get half on signing the contract. You get half uh, when you turn in the book and it's accepted. And then you don't make any more money on the book until they have sold enough for you to make back that advance on your royalty, which is typically 10% of the cover price. So that means I'm making, if I'm lucky, $2 a book is coming off to pay off that advance. Uh, and most, I, I don't know most, but certainly a large number of books never earn out their advance. So that advance is all that the author ever sees for publishing that book. But at least they have that and they're not making far less because they're relying entirely on royalties. And if it does pay out, then you start getting additional money on top of that. Uh, and if it's really successful, that's when you really start to make make money. If you're, you know, Brandon Sanderson or somebody like that, who just ran a $41 million Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm jealous. <laughs> that is fascinating. Um, I have another question for you. So when we think about science fiction as it's been, traditionally I'm putting in quotes, and now we have people, uh, private citizens, flying to the moon and who knows where that's going to lead but how will that impact the topic of science fiction if at all science fiction is never about predicting the future it's just about saying that the future is going to be different than it is today and you look at trends and you project them into the future but nobody really thinks that's exactly how it's going to play out and there's always a future uh, so uh, even though we are living in the science fiction of when I began write, writing science fiction, you know, my my pocket computer here, um, and, you know, the computing power we have is enormous. And, uh, you know, the being able to talk to people like this, video conferencing, that was science fiction, all that stuff. And certainly the, the space travel is getting there. I mean, with what Elon Musk is doing, um, that was very much a kind of, science fiction idea of the billionaire who's going into space. Heinlein wrote a story about the man who sold the moon, uh, about a billionaire who gets to the moon ahead of everybody else. He decided that was the only way to do it. Um, but uh, the future will still be different. And there's always more things coming that, you know, there's things like uh, genetic engineering that are, that will, we're just at the beginning of um, the space travel itself. I mean, the more we get out there, the more that the, future of it is going to look different and stories will change around it. Uh, so I don't think uh, science fiction is going anywhere. Um, I think that uh, the people who whose minds work that way will continue to find ways to project human society into the future and find ways to tell stories set in those imagined future societies. That's, that's using the definition of science fiction as something that looks at the impact of science and technology going into the future. Uh, defining science fiction and fantasy is a whole nother <laughs> kettle of fish and uh and people argue about that all the time thank you for sharing that that was really helpful so, uh, what i want to know is when, when you write science fiction um what comes to my mind is do you research on technologies that are already available technologies that will be in the future or you don't care about that at all there are different flavors of science fiction what's called hard science fiction is very much based on hard science, what we know now, and projecting that believably into the future. Uh, probably the best example in the media of hard science fiction was The Expanse, which did a pretty good job of what outer space would be. But even there, they had to fudge it a little bit in order to come up with some form of propulsion that could dip you around a bit faster than we currently can. Uh, it, so it depends on what I'm writing. Most of my science fiction is far future, 
uh, things are just assumed that, you know, like uh, interstellar travel and stuff like that. And if you, if you describe it or, or do anything about it, you just give it a, one of those made up words, uh, <laughs> to describe your, your space drive. I like to call my space drive, the Umstadt drive, because that Umstadt was my grandmother's maiden name. She was German. So <laughs> occasionally I'll stick stuff like that in, um, I, you have to, you know, I research things as they come up and if I feel like I need to. So, um, I, I try in my science fiction, and I also write fantasy, which is a different kettlefish again. But I, I do try if I'm going to do something in outer space, or I, I do try to at least make sure that I'm not doing anything that flagrantly violates the known <laughs> laws of physics, unless I have some technological <laughs> hand waving that says we can violate this particular law of physics. But I don't. I, the kind of science fiction I write, I don't uh, have to do tons and tons of research, although. There has been some. I, I did a, a series uh, that was set on a generation starship, and I, I actually have a book on my back, my shelf back there about building giant starships. And and you find interesting things that you can use in the story. Uh, for example, there was some horrendous. If you had something this like a kilometer long starship, the number of parts that you could expect to fail every day, <laughs> which is why I uh, staffed it with this this huge bunch of. Uh, uh, robots that ran around and was constantly fixing things because something was breaking all the time. And I thought, you know, I'd never thought of that before, but that's almost certainly true in a really complicated uh, uh, vehicle. I mean, things break on the International Space Station and it's nowhere near as complex as the Starship would be. Are you so, featured in any of your works? Um, my anthologies I've put my short stories into. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I meant you or you as a character. No, yeah. No, not, well, only in the sense that every character is you, because that's the only thing you've got. Uh, every character is you imagining some other character, but there's some sort of core in there of you, because that's that's I'm the only person that I really know how I work. <laughs> and we make the assumption uh, in as a fiction writer that other people work internally pretty much the way we do. And it seems to work because people do identify with the characters that I make up and that other authors make up. But I've never put myself in except in the sense that my sense of humor certainly comes through. Uh, and the World Shaper series that I mentioned, it's actually a female main character, but it's first person. And anytime you have a first person narrator, you're going to be in there to a certain extent. And she has, she makes Star Trek jokes and things like that for a perfectly good reason in the way that it's set up. She has access to that 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 kind of pop background, but they're totally my jokes. So. <laughs> I love it. As an author in general, when you write, you just go with the flow or you really sit down and say, no, it's time to write because you, you have a structured day or how does it work? No, I'm terribly unstructured. I wish I was more structured. And, you know, like every year or two, I think, you know, I should be more structured, but it doesn't really take... Um, <laughs> I tend to write, it, you know, I have so many things I'm working on. It's like I start in the day and say, well, what am I going to focus on now? And uh, you have conflicting deadlines and stuff. If I have a deadline, well, that certainly drives me to write. Um, if I'm really working on something and it's going well, I might write two or three hours a day of actual fiction. I'm a pretty fast writer, so that can be quite a bit. The most I've ever written was a 60,000 word book in two weeks. So I know I can write at that pace. Um, but I don't do that all the time because I have so much other stuff going on. But I'm not, I'm badly, badly structured. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that helped me with this structure, and again, I've only written one book and the other one's coming out, is I have a book coach and we meet every week. And that keeps me on point because we get a lot of the work done right then because it's on the calendar and, I, and someone's keeping me accountable. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, when I, um, before COVID, I was going to the gym every, like three times a week. Uh, and then the COVID actually killed the gym that I went to. So, but um, uh, I, that was the reason I, I got a personal trainer. I couldn't really afford a personal trainer, but I got one because that was the only way I was ever going to go to the gym. I had to have an appointment and somebody there expecting me to show up, <laughs> leave it to me. And there's always a reason. So right now, the way I, I, my daily exercise is, is I walk around Regina and on my YouTube channel, I actually do live walks live stream walks around Regina almost every day. And I talk about my writing and whatever. I just blab, 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 blab <laughs> as I walk around. And, uh, but the main reason for that isn't so much, I have like 300 
40 subscribers, I think, or something, which I guess isn't bad. But uh, the main reason is really because it's like me having an appointment with somebody. So it forces me to go out and walk, even if I don't want to, and helps me get my exercise. So that idea of having somebody to write with, like a writing partner, makes total sense. And I have heard of, of uh, other people who do that. They get together with somebody or with a group of people to write, and that encourages all of them to keep a regular writing schedule. Uh, we've come to the end of our show and uh, it's flown by so quickly. And Edward, I know there's a, a lot of ways that people can contact you. We've got a big banner for you. So I'm going to spotlight you. But for people who are listening on the radio and they can't read the banner, who would you like to reach out to you? And if you can share these various platforms where people can follow you. Uh, the best place to find me is my website, edwardwillett.com. Two T's on Willett. That's very important. That second T often gets dropped off. Uh, edwardwillett.com. I'm on Twitter at ewillett, uh, Instagram at edwardwillettauthor, Facebook at edward.willett. I missed that memo where you use the same handle for everything. Uh, and the YouTube channel is also youtube.com slash edwardwillett. So, uh, and then Shadowpaw Press is shadowpawpress.com and the World Shapers, my podcast is theworldshapers.com. And then all of their handles are the same. <laughs> Shadowpaw Press are the World Shapers. So yeah, I'm very easy to find you. If you Google Edward Willett, I think I'm the entire first page of results, which I guess is supposed to be good. So <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here. And we welcome you to come back on this or any of other shows. We have 20 to 25 live broadcasts every week. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Tell it to my feet. <laughs> I stand, I stand for all my shows. It's funny. but And I should say to Roland that I have been to Salzburg, so I know exactly where you are. Wow. <laughs> oh, very, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Roland, before yeah. Edward goes, would you just share with the audience uh, what you shared with me backstage about the methods you met in front of your RV? Oh, it was so funny because last night I was, I always park in, in front of farmhouses. So there is a an organization, a platform uh, where you become a membership uh, in Europe and then you can stay with different farmhouses. And I love that because I always buy stuff there, my food there. I, have, uh, I love to support local producers. Anyway, so and early this morning when I got up, there was a guy sitting uh, in, high in the mountain, really high in the mountain on this farmhouse. By the way, it was really scary to go with my RV up there because I have a little bit high fright. So it was, but anyway, so in the morning there was a guy sitting outside and he, he looked like a mountain guy and I talked to him. Hello, good morning. How are you doing? He said, oh, only English. I said, oh, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Alaska. I said, wow, what the <laughs> hell are you doing in the middle of all of Alaska? Well, anyway, he, he's responsible for a, a ski resort, a ski resort in Alaska. And besides the farmhouse, there is a huge ski area and they rebuild the, um, how to say, the gondola um, the, 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 the train, they rebuild it newly. So the old one will move to Alaska in, in the ski resort. That was an amazing story. <laughs> I love it. It really is a small world. <laughs> Absolutely. But thank you, but Edward, thank you so much because I learned so much from you and I guess the audience too, because it's, yeah, it was cool, really cool, interesting, honest insight. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. All right. Thank you again. We hope that you'll come back and see us. Anytime. Okay, stay warm. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye, Edward. You know, that is truly what I love about this platform. You and I have discussed this so many times is we have people like Edward coming and sharing really valuable information, and we're always learning. Yeah, the interesting point is, you know, the people that are really successful, they're really caring and sharing. They're sharing their, their expertise, and that's what I highly appreciate from these persons because they don't have to, but they are willing to do so. And I guess that's part of the success is their their warmness, their openness. They really care about other people, and that's what I really, really love about them. I love that too. Well, we're going to sign off for now, but I'm going to spotlight you, Roland, and if you could share again with our audience any information that you'd like them to know or any final words for this segment. <clears throat> well, whoever wants to, to get in contact with me, I'm always happy to talk to people, to connect with people. It's not only, to, to be honest, to sell my services. I just love to connect to people and, and, and get to know them, what triggers them, what is their vision, why they're here, what is their purpose in life, uh, what they're expecting uh, the next years from their life. I always love to connect. So feel free 
if you think this crazy guy, I would love to have a conversation with him. Go on my website, rolandfriddle.com. If you just listen on a podcast, I will spell it for you. It's R-O-L-A-N-D-F-R-I-E-D-L.com. And then you can fill out a contact formula. I come back to you as soon as possible. And yeah, let's have a conversation. Whatever you want to talk about, you're very, very welcome. Thank you. And I wish everyone a happy Easter, by the way. Yes. Happy Easter to everyone. Thank you so much, Roland. If you have a few minutes just to wait backstage, I want to chat with you about something. That would be I cool. will. All right. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching and listening. I just want to share that in addition to being able to watch us on our YouTube channel, on our website, both USA Global TV, also on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and somewhere else, I think, but I forget at the moment, uh, Twitch, that's what it is. You can also listen to us on the radio. So you can listen to us on Business Talk Radio, My Tuner Radio, Online Radio. So when we're live streaming, that's the show that you will be listening to. And when we're not, when we're off the air, you'll be listening to shows that have been on previously. So you can literally listen to us 24 seven. We'd love for you to watch this as well. All right, we're going to be signing off. Our next show coming up is the film and music show, and we'll be right back. You stay where you are. We'll be back in less than 10 minutes. Thank you. Bye.